Good afternoon. Thanks, Whitney and Glenn, for having me here today. It's been a really interesting, great set of presentations. I've enjoyed it a lot. This is the page my lawyers made me put up. So a little bit about me and Viola Capital Management. Okay. Um, you probably haven't heard of it because it's new. Um, while uh, the company is new, I am not. I've been on the buy side for 20 years and I've been a consumer specialist for over 10 years. It's a very interesting time for the sector I focus on because unprecedented disruption is creating a lot of opportunity, both long and short. And another thing about this sector that I like to remind people of is that 80% of household purchase decisions are made by women, yet over 90% of investment decisions are made by men. Um, so while I have shorted my share of frauds and bankruptcies and other wipeouts in my career, the bulk of my shorting is actually much less dramatic. It's fundamental analysis with a much less extreme end game. Sometimes I, and I start out looking at a company as a potential long, and then I realize it's a short, and that's how I get there. Other times there are good companies, but it's the wrong time for the company, and it's just a better time to be short a good company than long it. Um, so sometimes in consu consumer very high quality companies can be good shorts, and this is because of cycles. There are economic cycles, fashion cycles, weather cycles, and then the more secular shorts are sometimes drastic changes in consumer preferences and behavior create shorts. So an example of a, of a good company being a short at one point is here. Here's a consumer stock that worked very well short. It was down about 25% in a year. And I doubt anyone would guess what stock this was. Surprise, it's Nike. Uh, arguably the most iconic American brand of all time and one of the best consumer stocks ever. That short period I showed you on the last slide is just a little blip in an otherwise up and to the right long-term chart. And this is a very healthy company. But, um, but it brings me to the company that I'm going to talk about today, which is equally iconic as an American company. And that company is Ralph Lauren, which is in the middle of an attempted turnaround. So let's take a look at what's happened at Ralph Lauren. In the last three years, they've lost 19% of their sales, 37% of their operating income, and company-wide comps have been solidly negative in the mid to high single digits. It's a little bleak. So why did this happen? While Ralph Lauren has historically positioned itself as an upskill prestige brand, they overdistributed. It was simply available too many places, which led to discounting and margin pressure. Brand extensions confused the customer, and then the departure of longtime, very talented COO Roger Farr led to a lot of disruption within the company, as well as voluntary and involuntary turnover, much of which was set off by the very short tenure of a failed outsider CEO named Stefan Larson. So what did they plan to do now to fix this? Full details will be revealed in an investor day next month, but what is leaked out so far revolves around elevating the brand by reducing distribution points and pulling back on promotions. They also want to upgrade their product and marketing to help them reach a new customer, presumably a younger one. They're hoping that these efforts to prop up their brand will help them return to growth in their larger, more mature businesses, as well as accelerate growth in their smaller businesses like e-commerce and Asia. So how realistic is this plan? Clearly, some people on Wall Street think it's going to be really easy because the stock has moved 70% in the last nine months. I remain more skeptical. My comments today are going to focus on the North American business um, of Ralph Lauren, and that's because that business still dominates. In the fiscal year ending March, 2017, North America was 57% of sales and 59% of operating income. In the first three quarters of 2018, the year ends March 31st, 2018, so we'll get the full year soon, um, the results were that operating income was down 9.5% on a company level. So when 60% of your, or, I'm sorry, in North America, but when 60% of your business is down 10%, 
it's very hard to get the whole company to grow without turning that 60%. So that's why I'm focusing here. It's a huge headwind. Uh, and while, while people will point to American brands that have thrived abroad while floundering at home, most notably Ralph Lauren's competitor Tommy Hilfiger did very well in Europe in the early aughts while stumbling domestically, I believe that this may be a strategy from another era. There was a time when an American brand could control its distribution and its editorial coverage. So for example, they could decide they were selling in Harrods and place great articles in British Vogue and effectively control its international narrative. But in the age of Instagram, I don't think brands can control their story that way anymore. And I would argue, so goes Ralph in the US, so goes Ralph in the world. So let's look at North America and look at what they plan to do here. First, they're gonna trim distribution. And this makes sense. Everybody knows that department stores are in secular decline and it's impossible to control their discounting. And everybody loves a turnaround and the coach and Coors turnarounds have worked out pretty well stock-wise. Maybe not coach this week, but in general it's worked. And um, hope springs eternal that Ralph can just take a page right out of their playbook and increase their financial results by reducing points of distribution like they did. So can they? Well, Ralph has 170 factory outlet stores in North America versus only 46 full price stores. So that ratio of outlets to full price stores is 3.7 times for Ralph Lauren versus less than one times for Coach and Coors. So the ratio of outlets to full price stores just seems out of whack for Ralph Lauren and it's a challenge to elevating the brand. The other challenge to brand elevation is that Ralph Lauren is omnipresent in the off-price channel. So Ralph Lauren has created lots of channel conflict by leaning hard on TJ Maxx and Marshalls. You can understand why they did it. Department stores stopped growing years and years ago and off-price continue to grow. But getting too big in this channel has been cannibalizing to their full-price business. The problem is that the special make for outlet, I'm sorry, make for TJ Maxx shirt that is $34.99, the polo shirt that you can get there, it's just too good. It compares very well to the $85 polo shirt that you would buy in their full price store. Yes, the TJ Maxx shirt is a different shirt than what you get in their full price store. Does the average man know this or notice this? Probably not, and if he knew that it was a different shirt, would he even care? Probably not. So um, this is a problem. And just this week in New York, you could pay $85 for their classic mesh polo at their Madison Avenue store. You could pay $59.50 for that exact same shirt on their own website, rafflauren.com. Or you could go to Macy's Herald Square and pay $59.50 for that shirt during their friends and family event. Or you could go pay $35 for a shirt that basically looks the same at any of seven New York City TJ Maxx and Marshalls that I went to. So they've taken their iconic item, the polo shirt, and they've devalued it. And by devaluing that, they've devalued their brand, and this is a very big problem. And New York's not a fluke. So they say TJ Maxx is the home of the treasure hunt, but there's no hunting required to find a polo shirt at TJ Maxx or Marshalls. We did our own proprietary checks in six markets. We went to 21 TJ Maxx and Marshall stores. And every single one, the first thing we did was we looked for the core iconic item, that polo shirt. And it was in every single one. We found them in mainstream sizes, mainstream colors. We saw them prominently displayed, often in their own rounders that say America's favorite designer on them. You didn't have to hunt. And we saw that the product was, we saw product that was made just for TJ Maxx, and we saw a product that had been made for the full price channel, diverted to the off price channel, and then marked down by 50% or more. And there was a lot of it. And in fact, in one Marshall store in Phoenix, we saw hundreds and hundreds of men's classic polo shirts, hundreds of women's classic polo shirts as well. We didn't have the time to count every shirt in that store, but if we did, there would have been at least 500 pieces of just shirts in that store, Ralph Lauren polo shirts. So, and it wasn't just shirts that we found. When we walked around these 21 stores, we found a variety of other Ralph Lauren products. We think the amount of product available in TJ Maxx and Marshalls has devalued the brand and provides a strong headwind to the brand elevation efforts that they're embarking on. It's not something that you can see from your desk, 
and that's why the title of this presentation is Don't Try This at Home. You really need to go out and see the glut of Ralph Lauren product in the off-price channel to appreciate what's going on. So moving on to step two of their North American turnaround plan. Update the product, the marketing, and attract new customers. We wonder, if they can modernize the brand's look, will they alienate their core customer who's still shopping them? And if they do manage to update the look, if they build it, will they come? And when I say they, I mean millennials. So, we think it's gonna be tough. Ralph Lauren is still steeped in the same preppy country club look that they've been selling since the 70s. But young people today, they're not into golf and horses and country clubs. They like rappers and street style and Instagram and athleisure and fast fashion. So street style is where it's at. So what is street style? Well, there's definitely no uniform, which is the exact opposite of a preppy look where you wear one designer like Ralph Lauren from head to toe. It's a mix of high and low, so you save all your money for a pair of $600 Balenciaga sneakers and then wear them with a cheap suit that cost $129 at H&M. There's a whole new wave of fashion influencers out there, and some of them you may have heard of, like Kanye West, and there's others that you probably haven't heard of. There's fashion bloggers like Man Repeller and celebrities like ASAP Rocky, who has seven million followers going to see what he wears, probably not so many followers in this room. But if you want to see what street style is, you can take a very short walk from here to the new Nordstrom store, men's store in Columbus Circle. It just opened a couple of weeks ago, and it's a master class in street style. And you won't find a piece of Ralph Lauren in that store. And the bottom line is Ralph Lauren's preppy style is off trend, and this is a long-term trend. So there's no quick fix to their problem with millennials. Which brings me to the question, how do you make a brand hot when it's most relevant to a customer that was young when the things on this slide were still cool in a non-ironic way? So we wanted to get, try to get a sense of how big this brand problem was with younger people. So we went and asked 200 of them to, get, to name their top three clothing brands. And the first thing that really jumped out at us was the extreme fragmentation of the responses. And the higher income the household, the more likely they were to give small boutique brands. Many of the names in the long tail of responses were new and didn't even exist five or 10 years ago, which is a sign of how much the barriers to entry have come down in the age of internet distribution. Turning to Ralph Lauren specifically, they did much better with men than women. With men, they, replaced a they placed a respectable fourth place but really there were only two brands that dominated with men, Nike and Levi's. Everyone else, including Ralph, was an also ran and without a ton of advocacy. On the women's side, frankly, Ralph was DOA. They were in a six-way tie for 21st place. The takeaway from all this is that big incumbent brands may find themselves challenged and that newness is what the millennial customer may be looking for and also that the Ralph Lauren brand is really weak with young women. None of this is good news. So we think that the managing down of the less productive wholesale accounts may prove to be margin dilutive and not accretive as hoped. The company stopped disclosing wholesale versus retail operating margins two years ago, but back then wholesale margins were almost twice retail margins. They were 27% over the trailing five years versus 14% for retail. We spoke to over 25 people who had worked at Ralph Lauren or elsewhere in the industry, and several of them suggested that the company makes all its retail segment profits at their factory stores and that the full price stores lose money. So based on these historical margins, for every 100 million they migrate from wholesale to retail, we estimate they could lose between 12 and 25 cents in EPS. So going back to um, pairing back wholesale accounts, let's look, look at off price. Just how big is this? By our estimates, it's about seven, it was $700 million in fiscal 17. This is not something the company talks about. Um, we also think that TJX is Ralph Lauren's second biggest customer after Macy's. 700 million in off-price sales would make it 36% of North American wholesale sales, the off-price channel, that is. They mentioned on their last call 
that they've managed the off-price business down 20% in the year to date. So they've basically now admitted that they have a problem with this channel. And they've said that they want these declines to continue into next year. So if the business went from 700 million, our estimate for last year, to 550 this year, taking it down another 10 to 20% next year is gonna be a 50 to 100 million dollar headwind on a business that's already fighting to stay flat. And based on our conversations, the TJX business was highly profitable. So managing it down will likely be a significant headwind to the margin expansion that everybody's looking for. So our takeaway from all this field work and financial analysis is that a near-term return to top-line growth in the US is nearly impossible with the off-price channel being managed down and with department stores in secular decline. Additionally, even with sales down 20% or more, there is just way too much product at TJ Maxx and Marshalls. All this off-price channel inventory, especially when combined with 170 outlet stores out there, is a huge impediment to full price selling. At $107, it's trading like a luxury goods stock at 18 times. And the, this year's number, the March 18 number. So this company really needs to show tangible results within the next four quarters. So we're more bearish than the street on the outlook for top line growth and margin expansion. And we also think making progress with millennials is not a short term endeavor. A successful brand turnaround like this takes years, not quarters. And we think estimates are too high, but point out that expectations are low until the second half of fiscal 19 and that the upcoming investor day could be a positive catalyst. So have to ask, where could we be wrong? Um, there is a new CEO named Patrice Louvet, who people are quite excited about. And we haven't had the chance to meet him, and he could have some tricks up his sleeve that we don't know about. But I would only say, cite from looking at this chart that they've tried management changes before, and it hasn't been a quick fix. And then finally, I would just want to point out that while I don't want to be ageist, it's fairly unusual to see a board with three members over 80 on it, and then another five over 70. So I have to ask, is this really the board to lead Ralph Lauren into the new omnichannel retail era and fix a brand that isn't res resonating with youth? So in summary, the road to turnaround is full of divots. Ralph Lauren basically has a choice. They can go into rehab and go higher end by really shrinking the profitable off-price channel and cutting lower end department store doors. And this seems to be their plan for now, but will it be enough to elevate the brand given the high number of factory outlets, the low number of full price stores, and the brand damage that they've already inflicted? Also, they're choosing to divest from some very profitable business, which may be a healthy long-term decision, but it could be short-term dilutive. The other option is just to embrace where they are now and be a company that makes a lot of money in the off-price channel and outlet channel. But if they do that, international growth and luxury positioning and the margins that come with that will be elusive. So finally, we think that Ralph Lauren earnings are likely to be flattish over the next two years and come in around $6 for the fiscal year ending 2020. The major assumptions behind this are that North American growth will be down 4% a year, not return posit to, to positive growth, and that margin contraction will be 20 basis points a year, whereas the street's looking for it to start uh, expanding. This leads to an 11% earnings miss with larger misses as you go into farther out years. We think with the stock up 70% in the last nine months, the company has to execute perfectly or the multiple will contract. Um, we think that this company is more PVH than LVMH and should trade more like a commodity vendor and should be 13 times the $6 a discount to PVH for the lower growth. This leads a price to a price target of 78 for 30% downside. But I would say that this is not a valuation short. We think that the street is really misunderstanding how the company makes its money now. We think, and we think that they're definitely anchored into a brand strength perception that is at least 10 years old, if not 20 years old. Bottom line, we think that the street is treating this turnaround like it's a bunny hop when it's more like a triple toe loop into a triple axle. And that's what I have. Thank you.